Your Excellency President Klaus and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Global Warming Policy Foundation's inaugural annual lecture. I'm particularly honored to welcome President Václav Klaus and his distinguished delegation. I would also welcome the ambassadors from many European nations, as well as diplomats from China, India, and <coughs> Russia. Václav Klaus is not only one of Europe's foremost political leaders, but also an intellectual and academic heavyweight, an exceptional blend that is rare to find nowadays. Among political leaders today, he is conceivably the most eminent champion of classical liberalism. He is without doubt an inspiration to all those who value individual liberty, limited government, and the freedom to dissent from conventional wisdom. We could not have chosen a better or more appropriate speaker for our inaugural lecture. When we launched the Global Warming Policy Foundation just over under a year ago, in November, in the House of Lords, nobody could have predicted the extraordinary shift in public opinion and the political climate in response to the Copenhagen pilot. In the aftermath of the Climate Gate affair, the Copenhagen failure and the IPCC uh, debacle, there has been a noticeable change in the political atmosphere. Partly as a result of these sobering developments, partly because of our credible criticism, the Global Warming Policy Foundation has established itself as a reliable voice of moderation and intellectual rigor. We've not only been more successful, but we've also made a greater impact than anyone could have anticipated just a year ago. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for many years, President Klaus has been calling upon rational and freedom-loving people to respond to the threat that the global warming frenzy presents to freedom and democracy. As someone who lived under communism for most of his life, President Klaus has warned in no uncertain terms that collective environmental hysteria poses the biggest threat to freedom, democracy, the market economy, and prosperity. Tonight, in his inaugural lecture, he will reinforce this council. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, President Václav Klaus. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Lord Lawson, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here tonight, getting a chance to deliver the inaugural lecture of the Global Warming Policy Foundation to such a distinguished audience. Um, I would like to thank you for the invitation. I would like especially to thank Nigel Lawson. Even though it may seem that there is a whole range of institutions both here and overseas which bring together and support those who openly express doubts about the currently prevailing dogma of man-made global warming and who dare to criticize it, it apparently is still not enough. We are subject to a heavily biased and carefully organized propaganda and a serious and highly qualified forum here on this side of the Atlantic that would stand for rationality, objectivity and fairness in public policy discussion is more than needed. That's why I consider the launching of the foundation an important step in the right direction. We should keep saying very loudly that the current debate about global warming, and I agree, I agree with the Australian 
paleoclimatologist Professor Carter that we should always speak about dangerous human-caused global warming because it is not warming per se that we are concerned with. That, that, the, current, that the current debate is in its substance not part of the scientific discourse about the relative role of a myriad of factors influencing swings in global temperature, but part of a public policy debate about man and society. As Professor Carter stresses in his recent book, the global warming issue long ago ceased being a scientific problem. The current debate is a public policy debate with enormous implications. It is no longer about science. It's about government, the politicians, their scribes, and the lobbyists who want to get more decision-making and power for themselves. It seems to me that the widespread acceptance of the global warming dogma has become, has become one of the main, most costly, and most undemocratic public policy mistakes in generations. The previous one was communism. The debate has, of course, its scientific dimension, but this part of the debate doesn't belong here. I also do not intend to play the role of an amateur climatologist. Uh, okay, but I would say that it's not that simple to tell who is and who is not a climatologist or an expert on climate change and global warming. I agree with Professor Ross McKittrick, who once said that there is no such thing as an expert on global warming because no one can master all the relevant subjects. On the subject of climate change, everyone is an amateur on many, if not most, of the relevant topics. What belongs here is our insisting upon the undisputable fact that there are respectable but highly conflicting scientific hypotheses concerning this subject. What also belongs here is our resolute opposition to the attempts to shut down such a crucial public debate concerning us and our way of life on the pretext that the overwhelming scientific consensus is there and that we have to act now. This is not true. Being free to raise questions and oppose fashionable, politically and lobbyistically promoted ideas forms an important and irreplaceable part of our democratic society. Not being allowed to do so would be a proof that we have already moved to the brave new world of a post-democratic order. And I am tempted to say that we are already very close to it. We need a help from the scientists. They shouldn't only try to maximize the number of peer-reviewed articles or grants but should help the politicians as well as the public to separate environmentalist myths from reality. They should present relevant scientific theories and findings in such a way that would make it possible for us to decide for ourselves what to accept and what to question. I have been trying to follow the published theories for a couple of years and I'm strongly on the side of those who say that carbon dioxide is a minor player. It is not the primary cause of global warming 
and therefore humanity is not to blame. Looking back at geologic time, the 1998 Nobel Prize laureate for physics laureate Robert Laughlin says that, I quote, climate change is something that the Earth routinely does on its own without asking anyone's permission. And that far from being responsible for damaging the Earth's climate, civilization might not be able to forestall any of these changes once the Earth has decided to make them. He adds that the geologic record suggests that climate ought not to concern us too much when we are gazing into the energy future, not because it is unimportant, but because it is beyond our power to control. These formulations seem to me <coughs> rather persuasive. Most of us gathered here are not climatologists or scientists in the related disciplines of natural sciences, but economists, <coughs> lawyers, sociologists, and perhaps also politicians or ex-politicians who have been for years or decades involved in public policy debates. Uh, this is the reason why we follow with such an interest and with an even greater concern the prevailing intellectual and political climate, its biases and misconceptions, as well as its dangerous public policy consequences. Many of us came to the conclusion that the case for the currently promoted anthropogenic global warming hypothesis is very weak. We also know that it's always wrong to pick up a simple, attractive, perhaps appealing scientific hypothesis especially when it is not sufficiently tested and non-contentiously pushed forward and to base ambitious, radical and far-reaching policies on it without paying attention to all the arguments and to all the direct and indirect as well, uh, as, well as opportunity costs associated with it. The feeling that this is exactly what we have been experiencing motivated me to write a book with the title Blue Planet in Green Shekels, which I see you got before entering this hall, so it's almost not necessary to continue speaking. Yeah. <laughs> we should do something else and you could have a homework tonight. Uh, uh, the book which was published in May 2007, uh, I must say that it was now published already in 16 different languages all over the world, including such languages like Japanese and Arabic. And uh, the book in which I attempted to put the global warming debate into a broader perspective. A year after its publication, I was extremely pleased to get a book, An Appeal to Reason, a cool look at global warming, in many respects similar to mine written by Nigel Lawson. The book was very soon translated into Czech and I I, I wrote a preface to, to it, and uh, in the published copy of my speech, you will, you will get as an appendix my preface, to the Czech version, in English, the Czech version of Nigel Lawson's book. Um, when I listened to the introduction, I, I would say that we are not on the winning side yet. 
But looking back, we can afford to say that since the launching of the massive global warming propaganda at the UN Real Summit in 1992, and since its subsequent acceptance worldwide, several things happened that suggest some degree of optimism. First, the global temperature ceased rising, apparently. I know that it's not a proof of the non-existence of a long-term tendency of one type of another. Nevertheless, this is definitely true. Second, new alternative hypotheses for the explanation of climate fluctuations have been formulated. That's the second shift, second change. The third one, the reputation of the scientific standing of some of the leading exponents of the global warming doctrine has been heavily undermined. The most scandalous example being the case of the hockey stick, which constituted the basis of the 2001 third assessment report of the IPCC. I, 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 I would allow myself to quote the Australian uh, climatologist John Dawson, who writes, the hockey stick was the product of a pseudo-scientific mindset, faulty data selection, erroneous data identification, dubious statistical methodology, flawed mathematics, a perverted peer review process, a frenzied propaganda campaign, and unscrupulous defense mechanisms. It seems to me so perfect that I didn't dare to put it in <laughs> my own words because it can be overcome. This is, this is the absolute, absolute quotation. And the final change or shift is that, for example, even the Copenhagen Conference in December 2009 revealed to everyone willing to see the existing heterogeneity of views and the apparent contradictions of interests. Yet, the global warming alarmism and especially the public policy <coughs> measures connected with it have been triumphantly marching on. Even the recent worldwide financial and economic crisis and the enormous confusion, fear, as well as indebtedness it created did not stop this victorious long march. Let me repeat the three simple facts that most of us, I hope, are aware of. We can only wish our opponents, the global warming alarmists, accept that we do not question them. Otherwise, they would continue shooting at wrong targets, which is what they probably intentionally have been doing up until now. So the first simple fact. Let's start with a long-term fact that the global mean climate does change. No one disputes that. It changes now. It was changing in the past and will undoubtedly be changing, changing also in the future. In spite of that, we have to add that over the last 10,000 years, the climate has been much the same as at present and the average surface temperature did not vary significantly. If there has been any long-term trend, there has been an overall gentle cooling trend when we look at 10,000 years. Presenting the climate changes we have been experiencing in the last decades as a threat to the planet and letting the global warming alarmists use this bizarre argument as a justification for their attempts to substantially change our way of life 
to weaken and restrain our freedom to control us, to dictate what it is we should and should not be doing is unacceptable. Their success in influencing millions of quite rational people all around the world is rather surprising. How is it possible that they are so successful in it and so rapidly? For all the doctrines and ideologies, it took usually much longer to get such an influential and widely shared position in society. Is this because of the specifics of our times? Is this because we are continuously online? Is this because religious and other metaphysical ideologies have become less attractive and less persuasive? Is this because of the need to promptly refill the existing spiritual emptiness connected with the end of history series with a new noble cause such as saving the planet? The environmentalists succeeded in discovering a new noble cause. They try to limit human freedom in the name of something that is more important and more noble than our very down-to-earth lives. For someone, as was mentioned in the introduction, who spent most of his life in the noble era of communism, this is impossible to accept. So the second undisputable fact is that with all the well-known problems of measurement and data collection, over the last 150 years, which is a medium term time scale in climatology, in economics medium term is slightly shorter. Um, 150 years, it's already the Keynesian long run, and we are all dead, definitely. <laughs> uh, so in, this, in the last uh, 150 years, the average global temperature has shown warming, cooling rhythms superimposed on a small upward warming trend. That's for me the second undisputable fact. This trend has existed since the Earth, or rather its northern hemisphere, because the data from the southern hemisphere are not available, emerged from the Little Ice Age approximately two centuries ago. We also know that this new trend was repeatedly interrupted one important example being the period from the 1940s to the middle of the 1970s, another the period of the last 12, 10 to 12 years. The warming in the last 150 years is modest and everything suggests that also the future warming and its consequences will be neither dramatic nor catastrophic. It doesn't look like a threat we must respond to. The third, for me, undisputable fact is that also the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere fluctuates in time, sometimes precedes, sometimes follows the temperature increase, and that with all the problems of not fully compatible time series, in the last two centuries, we witness a mostly anthropogenically enhanced amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We know that its concentration increased from 284 ppm parts per million in the year 1850 to 310 in the year to 1950 and to 387 
in last in the last year. There is no need to dispute these facts. The dispute starts when we are confronted with a doctrine which claims that the rough coincidence of climate changes, of growing temperatures, and of man-made incre increments of CO2 in the atmosphere, and what is more, only in a relatively short period, period of time, is a proof of the casual relationship between these phenomena. To the best of my knowledge, there is no such relationship between them. It is nevertheless this claim that forms the basis for the doctrine of environmentalism. It is not a new doctrine. It has existed under various headings and in various forms and manifestations for centuries, always based on the idea that the starting point of our thinking should be the earth, the planet, the nature, not man or mankind. It has always been accompanied by the plan that we have to come back to the original state of the earth, unspoiled by us humans. The adherents of this doctrine have always considered us the people, a foreign element. They forget that it doesn't make sense to speak about the world without people because there would be no one to speak. <coughs> to reduce the interpretation of the casualty of all kinds of climate changes and global warming to one variable, CO2, or to a small proportion of one variable human-induced CO2 is impossible to accept. Elementary rationality and my decades-long experience with econometric modeling and statistical testing of scientific hypotheses tell me that it is impossible to make strong conclusions based on mere correlation of two or more time series. In addition to this, it is relevant and it, that in this case, such a simple correlation does not exist. The rise of global temperature started approximately 150 years ago, but man-made <coughs> CO2 emissions did not start to gr grow visibly before the 1940s. Uh, the temperature changes also repeatedly moved in the opposite direction than the CO2 emissions trend suggests. Theory is crucial and in this case it is missing. Pure statistical analysis does not explain or confirm anything. Um, two Chinese scientists, Guang Wu and Xiaomin Yan, published a study in which they used the, for the statisticians in this group, um, published a study in which they used the random walk model to analyze the global temperature fluctuations in the last 160 years. Their results, rather unpleasantly for the global warming alarmists, show that the random walk model perfectly fits the temperature changes. Because, and I quote, the random walk model has a perfect fit for the recorded temperature. There is no need to include various man-made factors such as CO2 and non-human factors such as sun to improve the quality of the model fit, they say. It is an important result. Do other models give a better fit? I have not seen any. The untenable argument that there exists a simple casual nexus, a simple functional relationship between temperature 
and man-made CO2 is only one part of the whole story and only one tenet of environmentalism. The other, not less important aspect of this doctrine is the claim that there is a very strong and exclusively damaging relationship between temperature and its impact upon nature, upon the earth, and upon the planet. The original ambition of the environmentalists probably used to be saving the planet for human beings, but we see now that this target has gradually become less and less important. Many environmentalists do not pay attention to the fate of the people. They want to save the planet, not mankind. They speak about nature, not about man. For these people, the sophisticated economic reasoning we offer is irrelevant. Only some of them look at the people. Only with them, the debate about the intergenerational discrimination and solidarity and about the proper size of discount rates used in any intertemporal analysis comes into consideration. Only here can the economists make use of some of their concepts and, and theories. The unjustifiably low rate of discount used by the envir environmentalist, notably in the Stern Review, so well known in your country, was for me the original motivation to enter the discussion five years ago. Chapter four of my book was devoted to the importance of proper discounting. Nigel Lawson did something very similar in his chapter seven with the title, Discounting the Future, Ethics, Risk, and Uncertainty. For him, I quote, the choice of discount rate is critical in assessing which policies might make sense and which clearly do not. I agree with him that with a higher discount rate, the argument for radical action over global warming now collapses completely. Page 83. Many serious economists argue the same way and are in favor of using higher discount rates. University of Chicago professor Murphy says quite strongly, I quote, we should use the market rate as the discount rate because it is the opportunity cost of climate mitigation. I, I suppose that the economists here would, would agree. This is what Niklas Stern and others around him clearly do not want to do. They think in misconceived ethical terms, but it is wrong. We do not deny that if the existing trend continues, rising temperatures will have both its winners and losers. Even if the overall impact happens to be detrimental, which is something I am not convinced of, the appropriately defined discount for the future will ensure that the loss of value in the years to come will be too small for the present generations to worry about. How is it possible that so many politicians, their huge bureaucracies, important groups in the scientific establishment, an important segment of business people, and almost all journalists see it differently? The only reasonable explanation is that without having paid sufficient attention to the arguments, they have already invested too much into global warming alarmism. Some of them are afraid 
that by losing this doctrine, their political and professional pride would suffer. Others are earning a lot of money on it and are afraid of losing that source of income. Business people hope they will make a fortune out of it and are not ready to write it off. They all have a very tangible vested interest in it. We should say loudly, this coalition of powerful special interests is endangering us, not the global warming. That's the reason why the subtitle of my book is What is in Endangered? Freedom, Climate or Freedom? And my resolute answer is climate is okay, freedom is endangered. Our interest is or should be a free, democratic and prosperous society. That's the reason why we have to stand up against all attempts to undermine it. We should be prepared to adapt ourselves to all kinds of future climate changes, including cooling, I would say. But we should never accept losing our freedom. And this is the message which I would like to leave here in London, in this room this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. President Klaus, thank you very much. You hear from that applause how much the large audience here uh, tonight have appreciated a really outstanding presentation from you. You are somebody of, who combines three qualities which I particularly admire. Intellectual co capacity of a high order, a passionate belief in individual freedom and liberty which has been reinforced by our own experience of living under communist rule for such a long time. And in addition, great courage. Great courage in speaking out as you have done publicly um, in, and written about it. And it is something which is a very important element in the There are some, like uh, me, who only come to it after we've left office, uh, another one is President Aznar of Spain, who, after he ceased to be President of the Spanish Republic, turned out to be of the same sort of view that uh, President uh, Klaus and I have. But it is your combination of, of huge intellect, of a passionate belief in freedom, and your bravery, your courage, which is something we should all applaud tonight. So thank you very much, and thank you for coming to deliver the inaugural uh, GW Global Warming Policy Foundation and your lecture. It will be hard to find a successor next year worthy of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you.